on this week's GTA 6 O'Clock. New details on one of GTA's most famous Easter eggs. And Rockstar's new animation system could change everything. It's all here on this week's GTA 6 O'Clock. Hello and welcome to episode 12 of GTA 6 O'Clock. Today we are covering a lot of things and something that I've wanted to talk about for a while, which is Rockstar's new animation system for GTA 6 and how it's going to change everything. But before we do that, I should say hello. I am James Jarvis and joining me, of course, is Dan Dawkins, DD. Hello, and I enjoyed the way you questioned your own name. I, <laughs> I am James Jarvis. It's because I'd written it down, <laughs> like last week, as JJ, and I took that out this week. But people did say in the comments that they quite enjoyed it. So Everyone um, knows who you are, that's good. I'm JJ, joined by DD, as always. Uh, Dan, we're three months into the show already, episode oh, 12. Oh, my life, really amazing. So, um, yeah, not long to go before we get some new <laughs> info, <laughs> right? Uh, we hope. Okay. Um, so, yes, as we say, this week is going to be a lot about Rockstar's new animation system. But, as always, there are a few things to pick up from last week's show, which was all about the Take-Two financials. And quite a few people in the comments suggesting and wanting to know about, could the Take-Two financials relate to GTA 6 pre-orders going live before the date of March 31st. And you'll all be pleased to know, based on some of your comments from last week, that Dan has been looking into even more financial stuff. Yeah, and I've got a caveat by saying I've only been looking at this just shortly before the episode, and I'm actually going to contact some people in our accounting team in our very large company, so to try and confirm this. Uh, long story short, my feeling is that they would not recognise those revenues. Um, the reason being, and this is uh, according to like general accounting principles of how you recognise revenue, in order to recognise revenue, two things must be true. So it says a critical event must trigger the transaction process. So at, at the most basic level, this is you go to a shop and buy a T-shirt, and at the point of sale, the retailer receives the revenue and they receive the goods, like a perfect exchange, and that revenue can be recognised. And then it says the other is uh, the money resulting from the transaction must be measurable within a certain degree of reliability. It says, simply put, the buyer of a company's goods must remit funds that match the stated price tag for said items. Uh, a further extension of this is that you can recognise revenues once a customer has received a product or service but not paid for it yet, um, so that you're allowed to recognise that revenue. Where it's much less clear is this scenario, let's say with GTA 6, where, well, first of all, when you pre-order, you're not always paying the $70 up front. Yeah, I think it depends on the store, I think. Like, if you went in physically and did it, sometimes you do, or sometimes you pay when you go in and pick up the game on the day that it's out. So I think different storefronts operate in different ways, which makes it even more complicated. <laughs> Yeah, so that's that's complicated. Plus, let's be clear, officially you cannot pre-order GTA 6 anyway. It's not available for pre-order yet, really. Like Rockstar haven't announced official routes and pre-ordering. So there's a further degree of uncertainty in what they'd be able to predict because that's not even a route yet and the pricing structures aren't fixed. There's modelling issues around what degree will be physical versus digital, what degree will be based on GTA Online concurrent purchases. Um, and the other the other side of it is when you pre-order, even if you like had committed to the payment, until you receive the goods, you can still cancel. So I I don't know, and this is an interesting question we'll dig around for next week. What is industry standard cancellation rates for pre-orders? Because and th there is there is mitigation in this because what you can do what what retailers would do, for example, is to report revenues and have a separate line for reporting returns. Mm -hmm. So that's fine, refunds, but with something like pre-orders where the customer never actually, you know, may not receive the goods within the reporting period, I don't think that means, you know, I think it means you can't trigger that as revenue recognised. I will dig further into this and get you a more definitive answer. If any accountants are listening, you've got a more intimate knowledge of this, please let us know. But my feeling is no, you cannot recognise it okay. at, at this point in time. And if you're an accountant from Take Two, even better, please get in touch <laughs> and let us know. Slip us a release date. That would be great. <laughs> um, there was one um, other comment from Mr. Game Changer 97 who said, 
I'm kind of surprised to see you not mention Borderlands 4 as a potential bump in revenue anticipated for the new fiscal year. Maybe people aren't aware of it, but the idea is that fans like Mr. Game Changer think that the game is going to be announced sometime in February, early March, uh, maybe around PAX East, because Borderlands 3 was announced at PAX East 2019 and released in the same year. So could this be a thing that... I mean, they're, they're very clear. It's quite a well-reasoned argument, actually, that it's not going to yes. hit the you know 1.7 billion that they're expecting, but it might contribute to it. Like we said last week, there could be a lot of other factors contributing to that thing. Um, so it's basically, is that a possibility? And I think the answer is yes. If in the next few weeks that they announce Borderlands 4 is coming. Um, but of course, Take-Two are now only the publisher of that game and Gearbox has been acquired by Embracer in like 2001, yeah. no, 2021. Yeah. So I I, just, I would suspect they still get a fair chunk of revenue from that. But but yeah, like you say, in no world would it match up to 1.7 billion. It's a really it's a really good point, by the way, and well made, like very very structured in terms of the way you've responded. I wasn't thinking about Borderlands 4 because I just wasn't thinking about Borderlands 4. It is in no way listed in their forward-looking statements because it's a surprise. Mm. Um, and I, they haven't, they didn't officially list GTA 6 despite it being the elephant in the room and they, they talked obliquely about the releases and it was obvious it meant GTA 6. There's no, there's no sense of a major unannounced AAA in the way they talk about their forward-looking projections. But it, you're quite right. It could be Borderlands. I just don't think it's going to be that degree of a leap. Another thing that uh, Mr. Game Changer mentioned was that there is a Borderlands film coming out this year, potentially. And so then the question from that is, are Take-Two going to get revenues from that deal, like from sales at the box office and that kind of thing. I think this is probably another thing we're going to have to look into uh, and see how that whole structure thing works. But if that film is coming out still in, in 2024, then there's a potential extra source for them to get some revenue there. So, you know, like we said before, this might all add up. Now, I've just, I'm doing some massive on-the-fly you know, uh, shredded style maths here. That's the best kind. Yeah. Now, Mission, for example, let's pick one of the biggest films in the world. Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning came out, really anticipated Hollywood release, felt like it slightly underperformed globally. That delivered 567.5 million US dollars of revenue, right? So it's still nowhere near a billion. On average, a studio takes 40 to 60% of that cut. I think it's 60% in home territory, 40% in overseas territories. So again, 60% of 567 million. You're talking hundreds of millions, not billions. Yeah. And Another, that's saying being split by you know, production companies, exactly. owners. And that would assume they took everything they were entitled to, which they probably don't. So... Another great point, and this is, you know, actually, and this is the this is how maths work. If you get lots of these little things, the the, the odd hundred millions add up to the billions, as I always say in my house. <laughs> so <laughs> that's the lesson for the kids. <laughs> um, you know, these are not the sums I'm used to working in, but maybe at a sort of uh, dollars and cents level, you can uh, you can understand. Okay, a little, a few more things there to look into for next week, but. There was one more point before we get on to the big topic, and this was an interesting thing from the ex, from an ex-GTA developer who's actually revealed the origins of the moon sniping Easter egg. Now, I hope you all remember the moon sniping Easter egg um, from GTA 3, GTA 3, uh, which was the one where if you got a sniper rifle and you shot at the moon, you could actually change its size. Um, but this was um, Obi, who used to work at Rockstar Games, gave us a little bit more information on how that came to be, correct? Yeah, this was a really fun thing that came out on, on Twitter where we probably all had that experience of sniping the moon in GTA and it would toggle between three different sizes. Now, that felt like a fun throwaway Easter egg. Now, the reason it happened is actually due to 
I guess, indecision and oversight within Rockstar. So what the developer said was the artists didn't know which direction they wanted to go with in terms of the magnitude of the moon. Some wanted it to be more realistic, I guess a bit smaller. Others wanted it to be more filmic and atmospheric, as in massive. (laughs) So he basically created three versions of the moon and said to them, you decide. And I think what happened is nobody got back to him. So he took the executive decision to have a toggleable moon activated with a sniper rifle. So like, wow, what an amazing, fun Easter egg. And well, well done that person for displaying autonomy. Yeah, yeah. He basically put it in to say, well, now you can shoot it with the sniper rifle and we can decide as we play. And then just everyone forgot to take it out. So it just stayed in there. And I think it was still there in San Andreas as well, which is like crazy that they just went, we're going to check that moon. And then like, no, 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 it's fun. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, really, really fun bit of GTA insider information there. Um, and maybe they'll bring it back for GTA 6. They won't. They yeah, won't. and it's a nice bit of tidbit of information. He also said that he was the man who put Rockstar in the stars. So uh, there was a famous, again, Easter egg where you could look at the star constellation in the sky and map out Rockstar in the stars the mm. same way you would the Big Dipper or any other big constellation. So well done, that person. Uh, if you want to see this in action, by the way, check out the uh, FGS TikTok and YouTube channels where we've made a little short video which shows this in action in a bit more detail from the dev in question. All right, then. Today's main topic, which is Rockstar, has a new animation system for GTA 6. Now, I need to caveat something. There's going to be a lot of talking in this because a lot of things to read. So at any point, Dan, (laughs) that you want to jump in or have any questions, please do. I won't be able to answer the questions, but please jump in. So (laughs) Rockstar has a new animation system for GTA 6, and I think it's honestly going to change everything related to how we interact with NPCs and that kind of thing. So this isn't new information, uh, but a a developer called Sam Yam on YouTube recently posted an excellent breakdown of what it all means. So it's been picked up by quite a few people in the last few weeks. We'll link the full video in the description, but I've pulled out some clips from her video, which are like sort of the most important bits and the most important bits that add talking points. So we can take a look at them. Uh, We've used clips from her video because she's much better at explaining it than me, basically. Uh, Hopefully, at some point, we'll be able to get her on the show and and really talk in depth about it. So if you're listening, Sam, please get in touch. I have reached out already. Hopefully, we'll get a response. Um, So this all relates to a patent Rockstar filed back in April 2023. And it's called System and Method for Virtual Character Locomotion. On board so far. Yes. Now, obviously, there's a lot of people straight away who went, I'm out. I don't know what that means. So top line, I think this is a change in how dynamic the animation will feel and the way it interacts. And it will make the game ultimately feel a lot more natural and procedural. Um, So let's enter the world of acronyms as a way to describe what will actually be something you'll see with your eyes and go, oh, wow. Yeah, this is the uh, then official description from that patent filing in April 2023. It is a system and method for controlling the animation and movement of in-game objects, i.e. players, uh, NPCs, other people. In some embodiments of the system includes one or more data-driven animation building blocks that can be used to define any character movements. In some embodiments, the data-driven animation blocks are conditioned by how their data is described separately from any explicit code in the core game engine. These building blocks can accept certain inputs from the core system, e.g. movement, direction, desired velocity of movement, and so on. But the game itself is agnostic as to why particular building blocks are used and what animation data, e.g. single animation, parametric blends defined by the user, and so on, the blocks may be associated with. So, there you go, Dan. Simplify that. So... We watched, before this began, some videos that maybe we can share within this broadcast so you are understanding the way we do. Essentially, game animation used to be kind of a pre-can thing that would uh, be decided by flowchart decision trees where you would have, like, top of the pyramid, one set of animation, something happens, there's two choices, you go down, there's five choices. There would be, like, a sort of flow to the way animations work. And and as games got more sophisticated, the blending between those states would become 
more sophisticated and more natural looking. But essentially what a character did was finitely considered. You know, there were, there were only so many ways you could combine those things. And, and, and you know, and you see that in the real world in GTA where uh, I was saying to James off air, you know, you might... To, to interact with the pedestrian, you aggressively brush up against them and they might have a sort of stagger animation. Cue all the, you know, you've watched on TikTok endless NPC memes of real life people pretending to be an NPC mm -hmm. and doing that weird thing NPCs do where they over dramatically tumble and then reset to the standing position. Yeah. Like it just looks a bit weird. So it's trying to remove that sort of moonwalky, weird, unnatural movement where animation states are forcing themselves to recalibrate. The idea of this new dynamic system is that it's no longer such a flowchart system, but characters have, and please jump in, James, as I get this wrong, they've got, like, uh, behaviour boards where there's certain animations certain characters will do that get triggered based on external stimuli and different states. So, for example... Uh, they might pre-program a character who has a certain walking gait, a certain kneeling style, a certain running style, a certain way they move their arms. You know, you you multiply this by 20, 30, 40 character traits, and it would be different from, let's say, uh, elderly woman to young athletic man, or, you know, female to male, or however you draw the, the sort of character movement parameters based on their strength and body type. And then the way those the characters then have this sort of information within them, and when they receive external stimulus, whether that's from the weather, so like characters could react to the weather, or whether it's from another character doing something, or something happening within the world, like an object being presented to them, that will then, the, their intelligent brain will dynamically react and trigger a set of reactions and animations that feel more naturalistic to the thing they're being presented with. So, like, long story short, like we talked about off air, it could be, and people have talked about this, in the trailer where we see Lucia leaning out of the car, the character in the car in front who's taking, like, a film of her holding his camera up it might not be that that's like a pre-rendered cut scene as such, even though it might be for the case of the trailer, mm -hmm. but it might be that in the world, were you to be able to lean out of your car, assuming that's even a thing you could do, characters might naturally decide to flip their phone out because they know that's a correct behaviour if they see something that's completely unusual. Now, this is it's so hard to describe in the abstracts, and I dare say on screen we'll have some... Like it, it made more sense to me when I saw some drawings of like yeah, the yeah. types of states and how right. this works. Well, let's uh, let's give our viewers and listeners um, hopefully some of that context. So we know that when you know when we spoke to Mike York, who's Mike York, who's the ex Rockstar animator, that some of his tasks included cleaning up mocap footage, especially on GTA Five, to prepare it for whatever purpose it was needed for. And the next stage then was adding code and making sure that it could do what it was supposed to do in a very oversimplified way. So uh, in Sam's video, she first starts talking about how the process for GTA 5 worked and the process of then getting that mocap data. So Nathan, I think we can run a quick highlighted bit of this. So let's do that now. We then slap the animations onto a character and then play them depending on their state. A state can be walking, running, jumping, sliding, dying. And characters can usually have multiple states at the same time, such as running and shooting. These states are usually managed within a structure known as an animation tree, which is a complex but flexible system that allows for blending and transitioning between the animations based on different conditions. Modern animation systems can take two different animations and blend blend them together to make one seamless transition. And you can have two animations on the same character running at the same time. This is called layering, and essentially we can assign different animations to different body parts. So let's say we want the running animation in the lower body part, and we can have the shooting animation in the upper body part. And that's where the dynamic part comes in. Rockstar uses procedural animations created during gameplay. This is achieved with something called inverse kinematics, which is a lot of fancy maths, basically. And it determines what bones and joints need to be bent 
to achieve a specific position or motion in the character. GTA 5 also uses another technique called motion matching, and this makes it look like the character is actually moving in a more realistic and fluid manner. So that is how things were working in GTA 5, and please go and subscribe to Sam's channel and check out the video. She's got loads of tutorials that you can sign up for if all of this tech talk makes you want to learn more about Unity and animation stuff. And I do realize this might be a bit technical, but it is worth watching that full breakdown. It's only about 15 minutes, uh, but we've just used the, some highlighted clips here, but the full thing is a lot more in depth and much better. Um, so it does give us a good understanding of what's going on in five, and crucially for some of the scenes in the trailer of six, uh, it's gonna help when we get onto the next bit of what is happening in GTA 6's animation system. So what I wanted to quickly, I just thought I'd jump in with a fun Easter egg and a bit of color about how animation systems used to work. Uh, I remember attending E3 in the year they revealed The Last of Us. And at the time, nobody had seen animation as naturalistic as The Last of Us. There was a scene in the trailer where Joel Fist fights with mm -hmm. a load of guys and I think everyone was remarking on how incredibly like visceral was the word that was overused of how his punches felt like they were connecting and everything was solid and the way they would blend between animations was so naturalistic now it was so remarkable to the point where I grabbed the Naughty Dog developer at the end of the demo session and was like wow that was amazing have you done this 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 and he said to me he goes oh actually um, we had a guest here just yesterday who had the same questions didn't know how this worked and I went oh who was that and he went well it was Hideo Kojima <laughs> I was like oh wow and he said like yeah Kojima came to see us and was also asking how the hell have you done that it's amazing uh, and he started trying to explain to me in very technical ways but what they did to push forward the old style of animation was to have like the characters fists in The Last of Us would emit tiny telemetry lasers that could map the fist in relation to where it was in 3D space so that the fist would like, you'd know it was like two inches away from the wall so the, the punch and animation blending would react to that. Mm -hmm. And what it would basically mean is as it got near a character's face, it would be able to look much more natural as it did it. So I think I, at the time I wrote some headline about Kojima confused by The Last of Us <laughs> hidden punch lasers. Um, and that at the time was the, the groundbreaking way to do things, but I think was a clever way to mask the deficiencies mm. of a pre-canned tree system, where this is something new. Yeah, and this is something that, as we mentioned, like Rockstar have patented uh, because they believe in it uh, and they don't want anyone else copying them. So you won't get that speech. Uh, like when you meet The Last of Us, they go, oh, yeah, it's, it's lasers. Rockstar will be like, <laughs> well, it's in the pattern, but we're not telling you any more than that. Yeah. Um, so this is where like the real fun stuff is happening. And it's in the new way that GTA 6's animations work. So I'm going to throw it back to some another clip from Sam's video to talk us through that. There's two key components to the system. And the first one is a shift to a data-driven animation system versus using the usual animation trees. Essentially, now instead of having dozens of complex animation trees per character, GTA will define certain motion types and motions per character. A motion type is essentially a style. And the motion would be the actual animation, like running and walking. So to give an example, let's say the main character, Lucia, would have a list of motions. And depending on her current state, how she's feeling, if she's sick, if she's injured, if she's drunk, her environment, and also the player input via a controller or a keyboard or whatnot, the system will automatically choose the next animation, taking into account all of these factors. So they take the animations they already have and piece them together to create thousands of variations. And the way they design this system is super smart. Each character profile has what they call their own blackboard. So Lucia has a blackboard that keeps track of her state, the weather, the temperature, her location, everything in the game. And that blackboard communicates with the game code to get all of this information and then relays it to the animation system, which then results in the system choosing the correct motion and style of animation to play. And something I found really cool was that you can actually inherit 
emotions of other characters. They have the system in place where essentially if you have a cowboy, the cowboy inherits from a male profile and the male inherits from the human and each of them have their own set of animations that the cowboy could use. So if the cowboy doesn't have a specific movement animation, he can just take that from the male profile or the human profile. So what this means, and I think what Sam goes on to say in the video, again, go watch the full thing. It's a lot more detailed and will give you a lot more information is that the characters in the game can now like adapt on the fly and communicate with each other to share their state and inform the animations that each one of them does. So if I understand it correctly, and I think this is what it means, is that when we look at scenes like you mentioned with Lucia in the car, just like you said, that isn't necessarily something that is scripted. That is something that that character has learnt and thinks that, oh, if someone is doing something crazy, my behavior is to get out my phone and film that and then, you know, like people would do in the real world. Mm. So it's that kind of stuff that it's doing. And I think you only have to then imagine what that means for all the interactions in the game. Like if NPCs will learn routines, react to other NPCs they come into contact with. Like There's some other scenes in the trailer, like that guy who's sitting down asking for money with like a chameleon on his chest, yeah. on his yeah. shoulder. Yeah. And he, some other NPCs walk by him and he then asks them for money. Now, that animation system could then change depending on who's walking past him because he would learn the state of people who are like in his vicinity and go, you know, so if you're Lucia and you're walking past with loads of cash, he might then ask you for money compared to if you don't have any money, it will be able to like detect, hey, the player's got no money or they're wearing mm. terrible mm. clothes, I'm not going to do this thing as opposed to this other thing. And if you then extrapolate that even further, depending on how much money you have or the clothes that you're wearing, the state that you're in, the NPC shopkeepers could then say they could react to you differently or they could even like bar you from going into certain locations because they're like, hey, you're not of this status or you don't have enough money so you're not now coming into this place. It's like, it's quite mind blowing what it could mean for the game. Yeah, and it, it gets my mind firing largely because you then you start to think through to what extent can this potential be realized? Because let's take that example of the guy with the chameleon. And let's say he, he had a behavior where he could recognize, say, a kind or happy face from a sad or troubled face where let's say Lucia had just come out of an exploding car and looked like she was dragging her feet and dying, his instinct may not be to ask for money. Uh, equally, let's say she's been to a high-end clothes retailer and is happy, would he then be more inclined to say, or to put his hands out? Or would it be things such as, let's say you as Lucia walk past the guy and, you know, heaven forbid you should do this, but like boot him in the legs or something, would he learn to cower from you or not to put to go near you? And I, I, where I struggle with this is to what level can this actually be applied and remembered? Mm. Because if each NPC, and this hundreds if not thousands, had this level of intricate memory, it, it, just, it just isn't the processing power or memory to retain all of this. So there must be some hierarchy of you know, how, how much can they remember? Is it the last one thing, two things, three things? Is it that certain events take precedent over others? So is it that, uh, you know, s being really angry overrides the fact that it's sunny? You know, all these sort of all these different things that can affect your mood and behavior in yeah. real life. Which of those has the algorithmic priority to be the thing that the character responds to? That we, we talked off air about the idea of uh, the scene on the beach where. I think a character's offering another character, is it a can or something? Or? Yeah, they're like, he throws him like a beer. And it's it's that, that where you go, well, the animation is, who who decides that is a, a generous gesture, a, a kind throw, or would the receiver see that as an aggressive throw? Like, what what? how is the, the stimulus and interaction system working? Because it feels like there always needs to be, in my mind, a hierarchy of the primary stimulus that dominates the chain of reaction events and the extent to which that's remembered i don't know i guess it's, like it's in the same thing. way you know it's it's 
they're trying to recreate real life, right? Yes. So if yeah. if you and I were on a beach and you threw a can at me, I would interpret that as oh, it's just a friendly throw. Hopefully, yeah, like a, a, a gentle underarm lob yeah. versus a quarterback style spin. Exactly. Spin but if attack. it's someone like that, maybe you didn't know who's throwing a beer can at you, you might yeah. be like, hmm. I'm not quite sure how to interpret. Maybe this is okay. Maybe it's not. Um, in in the video that that Sam's done, the longer one, it does go on to say how they've done it and why they've done it. And it, but it's basically a whole load of machine learning and a heck of a lot of time and resource. So what they've done is is basically taught it what they want it to do, and that is saved on in-game memory usage and processing power, which frees that stuff up to do other things. So whereas in the past, those animation trees, they yeah. would, like you say, they would have had to program it for every, you know, give it yeah, to every single like a character. degree of eventualities, yeah. But now with this new Blackboard system, they can basically say, you are a middle-aged man in a office job who does this, this, and this. You're mostly happy, and then ideally send that character out into the world and just see what happens yeah and then how does that character and their pre-programmed traits interact with a different character type mm. just like real life and that this is where it gets fascinating because it's almost like uh, pulling the veil on real life social dynamics and the in the multiple invisible cues that affect the way we behave which we're constantly scanning and adapting for a level where we don't even recognize uh, th i guess my my probably not that solvable question back to you is like how deep do you think this canon will go and like do you, how do you think it will play out within the game i i mean i can see it being primarily used for npc interactions and you will just exist you know as lucia or jason as somebody else in that world but interacting with it and those people in a way that you normally would, but I think you'd get more realistic reactions from groups of people. So like you say, whereas in GTA 5 before, if you bash into people, they have similar reactions, a lot of them. And if you're not in the sphere of, you know, where other people can see you, no one else does anything. And I th think in this new GTA 6 world, that will be a lot more dynamic. So you bash into someone, they will do a multitude of things depending on how they're feeling what the weather's doing if they're late for something you know if they've had a bad day or they've you know previously been run over by your car or whatever and then the people around them could then learn that state that puts them into a frenzy and it could trigger a load of other things and i think that kind of stuff having a much more dynamic world is what we'll see rather than you being able to, you know, talk to everybody and they'll all say different yeah, things. Yeah, we, we, yeah, which it just feels beyond the grasp of where we are right now. Uh, what, I'd be, what, I, what I think what would be brilliant if it's led to is this sense of, like, procedural uncertainty and chaos or, like, emerge, sorry, emergent chaos. So let's say I, I, I ran into the, uh, the beachfront with a flamethrower and, and like whipped it out and did a gust of flames in a crowd of people, like based on their personality blackboards, how many would literally run away? Mm. Who would shape up to fight me? Who would cower behind a tree? That'd be a pretty rubbish place to hide <laughs> yeah. from a flamethrower. But that's the stuff I think where this becomes fascinating. And I could imagine then this would make online much more fascinating it would make capturing gameplay for sharing on social much more fascinating because it really would be look at this one in a million thing where i was in my sports car about to do a jump and a guy leapt on the bonnet or he leapt out of the way or he leapt out of the way and fell down a cliff or whatever the behavior is and you've seen this a little bit in gta over the years where even when you know you rough you knock someone over and he's like hey buddy watch out and he'll swing a punch at you they'd already program crude Mm. aggressive versus passive behaviors into the game but if they could make that even deeper and sort of add that layer of emergent chaos it becomes such a richer game that you want to return to because you can never quite predict what's going to happen and i did feel i always felt like this is the 
the world that GTA needs to go into to make that next leap? Because it's already done big, beautiful, wide, deep. All that stuff's done really, really well. Visual fatality is huge. It's the believability and the chaos of the world. And there's a lot of games since GTA V that I think have moved the bar there. So even when I, at the time I remember playing uh, Metal Gear Solid V, which is very Spartan environments, but the level of interaction within the world is high. So things like you could... Uh, steal a horse, ride the horse away, use the horse to poop along a street, hide in the bushes, wait for a car to come past, which was skid on the poop, and then fall into a load of your pre-programmed traps. So actually your your ability to create complex interaction chains in something like GTA 5, not GTA 5, MGS 5 was huge, which showed up GTA 5 as a bit like, you know, I am walking against a box and rubbing my face on it, or I'm driving a car or I'm shooting. And then taken further again, it's things like Breath of the Wild, Zelda Breath of the Wild, where the objects in that world felt dictated by physics and they break. So, you know, if you whacked things too much, they would snap. Mm-hmm. If you if you used like a sort of elasticated device to fire something, it would bounce in a realistic way. And p- things would catch on fire where they touch each other and the flame would transfer from one object to the next. The, these are the interim leaps in believability in open worlds that we've seen in the last few years. If GTA could start to mimic some of that within its world, you know, we'll, we may never need another game. It's got everything. And games like, you know, games like Skate or um, something like um, Gang Beasts or um, Goat Simulator, physics-based games where you play them purely to create chaos, chaos within the sandbox. <laughs> If GTA could have more of that, it's a game within a game within a game. Wow. Yeah, and if you can create that chaos that then, like you say, affects other things that happen, so you just, you know, tip the top of the dominoes and then yes. watch everything else yeah. fall down yeah, yeah, around yeah. you, yeah. like that's the kind of thing that you'll just be like, well, I almost never have to play anything again because. I did this and this happened and then I told you about it and you went and did it and something completely different happened because, you know, people were, you know, it was sunny or it was 10 o'clock or whatever. I think that kind of stuff is, like, incredible. If they can even get close to anything like that happening and and like we thought was going to happen in 5, like, these NPCs would have routines and, like, if you can now follow somebody around who goes to work and then goes to, like... A restaurant and then goes home again but does slightly different things on a, a different day or you know a different 24-hour cycle and there's hundreds maybe even thousands of people in that world that you can do that with like you, you could just spend all your time just following people around not like a stalker that would be no bad. no 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 <laughs> but in the confines of the game and i think you know ultimately i, I don't think this will be the fullest realization of where this leads because of there's still technical boundaries and this side of let's say somehow rockstar had gta 6 working in the cloud in real time communicating with the world's biggest data farm then i could maybe believe that each npc has a living memory like a cell in the matrix but it's not going to do that to my knowledge right i'd be amazed were it to do that so i think there will be a fairly simple simplistic memory chain like i said where maybe they remember two or three things that have happened to them that becomes their new primary behavior or they defaulted Mm. to or they defaulted to overreact to certain key conditions because you have to simplify the system or the calculations become so immense it's almost overwhelming Um, yeah so that that will that will be fascinating to see how they resolve that someone far cleverer than me could explain how that's done through maths and systems but I imagine that's the type of decision making you've got to do about how you take hierarchies and you know it's got to be these these calculations happen so quickly yeah. because the for the animation to react in time for a way for it to feel natural is faster than the eye can react to and that's a lot of data to take in so they have to simplify that process somehow and uh, like like what it does start to do is probably blur the line between the single player experience and the online experience because you know in the online world everyone's doing mad things all the time like you can't yeah. turn a corner without someone driving a car into a motorbike and then speeding off with a rocket launcher firing at you so i think it might start to blend those two things together and then eventually you know, down the line maybe we get a, a version of gta that is just hey you get to 
like the way that they've acquired, you know, the role playing servers, it's very much that, right? You know, you I'm going to be the recycle man who comes and just collects all your rubbish every week and I'm just going to drive around the streets doing that. Uh and then something crazy happened in front of me and then I went off and did other things like it's it's starting to create those worlds. Yeah, and becomes fascinating when you think about it in context of them leaning into the role playing communities having this level of like learning and behavior could make it even more you know, these are really big unknowns but could make it even more fascinating what i think would be nice is if you know in gta to this point if you act like a maniac in a way that you never would in the real world the punishment within gta has essentially been you incur a wanted level and eventually you'll be taken down if you were to, in real life, act like a jackass, I mean, that, that, that might be true. The police might turn up and put you in prison, but you'd, you'd suffer a much more immediate punishment in terms of people going, oh, my God, you're a jackass, or leave me alone. or like, People would permanently alter their behaviours mm. to you. Where in GTA, it was like, you do your time in pretend prison and everything's reset. Yeah, like the long-term implications were never there, right? They yeah. never were like, oh, you've robbed five shops, so don't come into my yeah, shop. Yeah, never come into my shop. Like, it's all it's like a reset, isn't it? Hard yeah. reset. Because you I think that's money. really difficult to do, right? Like, oh, Because yeah. you want to rob shops in GTA, and if they start going, stop robbing my shop, it, it be, it's a weird gameplay dynamic. Yeah, we can't let you in, and because you did this horrific rampage last... Well, you know, <laughs> if, if it was real, you'd go into prison for the duration of the game and never be allowed to play again, yeah. the side of breaking out. Then you'd be eternally hunted and make for a terrible, terrible game. But I just think there could be richer ways to recognise or punish abnormal behaviour within a virtual mm. world. And I think yeah. that's the stuff that would be so fascinating to play out. All right, well... That about takes us to the time of this week's episode. Let us know what you guys think about that new system, how, which ways you think it would work in the comments below. Follow us on Twitter at GTA BO Clock. Thank you all for watching. Thank you all for your comments last week. There was loads of comments, lots of things, lots of really interesting things to go through. Dan is going to do some financial research for oh, next week. Oh, yeah. Uh, and we will be back next Wednesday at 6pm for another GTA 6 o'clock. <laughs>